Guten Abend und herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zur Reihe Lecture and Film, Tropical Underground, das brasilianische Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir heute Abend, äh, vielleicht eine kleine Runde, aber sehr speziell, ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie gekommen sind, weil heute Abend haben wir eine sehr äh, spezielle Gäste hier mit, mit uns, äh, Irene Small. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass sie heute da ist. Sie wird ähm, danach ähm, näher vorgestellt werden von Vincent Rediger. Und ähm, ich äh, will nicht so viel zur Reihe sagen. Ich glaube, die, die die Reihe schon seit letztem Oktober hier folgen, wissen schon, worum es geht, um Cinema Marginal. Und vielleicht haben auch schon andere Filme gesehen ähm, und werden vielleicht sogar ähm, eine oder die andere Sache wiedererkennen, die in diesem Film heute Abend ähm, wieder auftaucht. Ich wollte ganz kurz wie immer auch auf äh, unsere andere Vor oder Veranstaltung dieser Reihe oder diesem Camp dieser Campusveranstaltung, die eigentlich dieses Mal größer ist als die Lecture- und Filmreihe hier im Filmmuseum. Und zwar, morgen haben wir schon eine Vorstellung im sars fee pavilion äh, bei Escherheimer Tor. Und das heißt, wir machen da eine Präsentation von äh, super art filmen von Elio Etisica gedreht, die wir äh, aus äh, kuratorischer Grund haben wir dann doch entschieden, die äh, digital zu zeigen. So leider nicht äh, die original super art wie wir ursprünglich äh, uns gewünscht haben. Aber wir haben sehr gute Digitalisierungen äh, davon bekommen und werden wir morgen auch in der Wesenheit von Irene Small und äh, sehr so richtig sicher viele, die auch, der auch heute bei uns ist. Sie werden das morgen ähm, präsentieren und am Samstag laufen die Filme auch von 12 bis 6, wenn ich mich nicht irre. Ähm, auch im Sass Pavilion werden die Filme da zu sehen sein. Und dieses Wochenende auch, wenn Sie hier noch nicht äh, genug von Tropical Underground gehabt haben, zeigen wir hier im Filmmuseum am Sonntag einen Dokumentarfilm über Torquato Neto, den wir vor zwei Wochen hier gesehen haben bei dem äh, Kurzfilm, die äh, Leo Felipe uns äh, vorgestellt hat. So der äh, äh, Vampir oder der äh, Nosferatu in Brasilien, Torquato Neto, wird dann selbst so näher in diesem Dokumentarfilm erklärt. Also ein sehr, sehr wichtiger Künstler, der auch in Brasilien äh, leider nicht so bekannt ist. Ähm, Habe ich von vielen Leuten gehört, dass äh, sie nicht genau wissen, wer Torquato Neto war, obwohl er so wichtig für die tropikale Bewegung in Brasilien war. Und deswegen, wenn sie nicht wissen, wer Torquato Neto ist oder wenn sie doch wissen, wenn, wer er ist und wissen, wie wichtig er ist, ähm, sollen sie sicherlich äh, noch mehr erfahren bei diesem Dokumentarfilm hier am Sonntag um 20.30 Uhr. Alle Informationen sind auch im Programmheft des Filmmuseums zu finden. Und äh, damit schließe ich schon meinen äh, kleinen Werbungsteil hier von der Abend und ich bitte Vincent Rediger, unsere Gäste heute vorzustellen. Vielen Dank fürs Kommen. Okay, and I'm switching to English as usual. Um, the uh, the focus of this series on the, is on the cinema marginal, but um, as the scope of the entire campus event, Tropical Underground, suggests, uh, even the cinema marginal cannot be understood without its context and without talking about somebody like Torquato Neto, talking about poetry, talking about music, and spe especially also talking about um, the visual arts. Um, so, if you want to get a proper understanding of what's happening in that really uh, auspicious and highly productive moment in Brazilian culture and counterculture in the late 60s and 70s, you cannot just look at one particular phenomenon or the cinema in isolation. You have to broaden your scope and, and bring in people who can talk about other things as well. Um, One of these people is Irene Small. She is a uh, an assistant professor at this point, soon so to be associate, I'm guessing, at uh, Princeton University. Uh, she got her first degree at Brown and then moved to Yale, where she earned a, a master's in art history and a PhD in art history. And she is uh, one of the great specialists in the work of uh, uh, artist Ilio Chisica. Who, um, whose installation, Tropicalia, as many of you will know by now, um, uh, you know, provided the title for the Tropicalia movement and, and kept on being in a, an important uh, reference um, uh, throughout that uh, particular 
phase and moment uh, in, in Brazilian culture and counterculture. Um, Elio Chisica, of course, is also somebody who worked with um, Ivan Cardoso, Ivan Cardoso, the filmmaker whose film, uh, O Segredo da Mumia, we showed earlier in the cycle, um, uh, made a film about Elio Chisica and filmed uh, uh, many of uh, Elio Chisica's performances in, in the 1970s. And uh, part of that um, cycle uh, was also Eduardo Viveros de Castro, the anthropologist whose photographic works we exhibited as part of Tropical Underground uh, last year and earlier this year at the Museum für Weltkultur. So uh, we're really talking about uh, a, uh, a scene of artists, scholars working together on a variety of projects and um, uh, in order to be able to, to place their work, really, we need to uh, look at the entirety uh, of those uh, relationships. Another collaborator, sometime collaborator of Elio Chisica is Giulio Bressani, the, the filmmaker whose uh, film we're going to uh, screen tonight, and uh, Irene's going to do the introduction. Um, Giulio Bressani is one of the protagonists of the Cinema Marginal. He was... Um, uh, based out of Rio and joined up with Ruggerio Scanzella in um, 1967 to form the Bel Air, the short-lived Bel Air film production company, which, uh, in which uh, Elena Inez, of course, was the, the third co-author of, of the films that uh, they made there. Um, and um, that crew produced uh, seven films in like three or four months before and this is another important point before going into exile and uh, continuing uh, to work there because the film that we're seeing tonight is actually a film that was not shot in Brazil um, and uh, stands for that particular aspect of the Brazilian counter and subculture um, in, in the 60s and 70s, uh, which is uh, uh, the continuation of <clears throat> doing that kind of artistic work outside of Brazil. And uh, Elio Chisica, of course, is also uh, someone who went through a phase like that. He went to uh, New York, actually on a scholarship, but still it became an important phase of his work. And I think Irene's also going to talk about that um, in her introduction uh, tonight. Irene is the author of a, um, I think nothing short of sumptuous uh, describes it correctly, uh, of, a, of a wonderful book on Elio Chisica, which was published in 2016 by the University of Chicago Press, which is called Elio Chisica Folding the Frame, a monograph on uh, Oichisica's earlier phase, uh, actually um, pretty much up until uh, he uh, leaves Brazil. Um, and in addition to that, she's the author of numerous essays on contemporary art, Ojisika and its context, but also on Piranesi, for instance. So uh, you have a very broad scope, um, as uh, one should expect from a, a proficient uh, art historian. She's a, a, an art curator. Uh, she's done a lot of um, uh, exhibition work and uh, published a lot of uh, um, contributions uh, to catalogs. And we're very happy that you could make it here uh, tonight to present this film to us, which you have picked for tonight. Thank you, Irene, for coming us coming here, and uh, please welcome together with me, Irene Small. Thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, to Vincent for the introduction, and Laura, um, and Lily. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and it's part of this very, you know, really fabulous film series. Um, and I also want to thank um, all the people who literally are making this film screening possible, from the projectionist to the people who are cleaning afterwards, to the people who take tickets and welcome us all at the door. Um, I'm sort of going to speak about expanded cinema, and I think it's important to um, insist upon that fact, right, that cinema is not simply a filmic experience, but an architectural one and a social one as well. Now, um, as Vincent mentioned, I'm really, um, my research has focused primarily on Oitisika's um, sort of earlier period, the years in which he was um, developing a kind of paradigm of participation and in, in a conceptual program for it um, in the um, early to mid-1960s. 
But if you have even a glancing knowledge of Oitisika's work, you'll know that the work and his writings are this quite intense labyrinth that is um, absolutely magnetic in its pull. So I'm also interested in the years that he spent in New York um, from 1970 to 78, and these were years that he was intensely engaged with film. And um, the reason that I wanted to watch um, and screen this particular film, which is Julie Bressani's Memoirs of a Strangler of Blondes from 1971, is this very um, intriguing comment that was made um, by the Brazilian poet and literary theorist Haroldo Campos um, in 1971 in a conversation that he had with Oitacica. And I'll, I'll go into more details about this later. But the, the substance or pivot of de Campos' comment was that in this particular film, film, what was strangled was the verbal rhetoric of cinema. Um, so, you know, what, what exactly would this mean to strangle the verbal rhetoric of cinema? What kind of language is cinema, after all? Um, by what means does it become rhetorical? And if cinematic language is verbal, as de Campos is suggesting here, um, is it merely borrowing from other discursive forms like print or speech? Um, what happens when we think about the sonic and oral aspects of film? And, you know, most intriguingly, what happens after such a strangulation, right? What, what happens after this? And as I thought about these questions, um, it became clear that this comment by Harold de Campos was also a missing link between um, two other statements. Um, the first by Marshall McLuhan, which you see here from his 1964 very influential book, Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, and he writes, film was as a form the final fulfillment of the great potential of typographic fragmentation. And the second um, from Oitisika, and this is him writing in 1970 from Rio, which is an interesting moment because it's um, in between when he comes back from London, um, where he had a very important retrospective in 1969, um, and spent most of that year in London. And a few months before he goes to New York, where he will then stay until 1978, and he says, I want to create a new language. It doesn't matter or by what medium or how. And I'm translating um, Oitisika's word meos here as medium, but it actually can signify means or media or mediums. So already we're getting a sense of the fungibility of the concept of medium and the way Oitisika is using it rhetorically, in fact, um, within both the verbal language in which he's writing and apropos of this entirely new language that he wants to inaugurate. Um, uh, so here, just to give you a visual sense of, of the kind of work that Oitisika was making in the 1960s in which he became famous for, um, he invented this participatory form called the parangole, which is a, um, most often a kind of cape for dancing, and you see that on the left, um, as well as uh, the famed tropicalia, which you see this kind of environmental structure. This is installed um, in London as part of the Whitechapel exhibition. Um, but he was also intensely engaged in film and cinema, primarily after he came to New York. Um, they were the subject of many, many writings and letters, as well as actual experiments. And we're going to look at some of the Super 8 films um, tomorrow. Um, but perhaps most interestingly, at least, at least um, from my point of view, is that he experimented with a kind of expanded um, or quasi-cinema. And the most sort of conceptually resolved of these are a series of slideshow environments, or more, more accurately, scripts for slideshow environments that he realized in collaboration with the Brazilian filmmaker Neville Dalmeida in 1973. And these are as a group called Cosmococo's Program in Progress. Um, and you can see here, this is mounted in 2005. Um, they are participatory, um, spatialized works, and they are comprised not of filmic projections, but multiple slide projections that um, are dispersed on the walls and sometimes ceiling of a space. And importantly, they were never shown in Oitisika's lifetime, um, although they are now recognized as absolutely fundamental to the trajectory of both of the artists and really to the, you know, the history of expanded cinema as such. Um, Oitisika in 1970 could not have imagined this particular form of expanded cinema that he would invent with Delmeda in 1973. And de Campos certainly couldn't have imagined it either when he talked about Brissani strangling the verbal rhetoric of cinema. But I think when we constellate these quotes, 
um, we can start to get at the, the mediatic implications um, of these post-cinematic experience. And I'd like to call them in this presentation um, analphabetic. Um, in Portuguese, the process of becoming literate is called alphabetização. Um, so by analphabetic, what I want to communicate is a state that's neither alphabetized or unalphabetized, um, in other words, neither literate nor exactly illiterate, but something that sort of runs transversal to both of those conditions. Um, something like inhabiting a language in formation, um, a language that forms perhaps after its strangulation. We can sort of see, assess that after Bassani's film. Now there's one more element that I kind of want to put on the table, um, and that concerns the way in which film, in, in you know, the very broadest sense, always had a very particular purchase for um, avant-garde artists like Oitisika. Um, film, unlike painting or sculpture, was never a kind of fine art, right? It has these roots uh, in a popular mass form of entertainment. Um, and although avant-garde artists, of course, made highly self-reflexive, even hermetic films, and, and really most of the films in the series are of this type, right? Um, there is nevertheless a kind of um, link always to this collective form. And um, so with this link, I think, comes a notion of the popular, a notion of audience, if, even, even if it's a dream of audience, right? And importantly, a notion of exiting the kind of bourgeois world of taste, which came with fine art. And I think in Brazil, um, cinema marginal directors were really fascinated with this affiliation. It's part of what distinguished their work, of course, from the cinema novo um, practitioners who came before them. And um, I think this is a really great instance of, of this kind of enthusiasm. Um, you see here on the top a picture of the filmmaker Jose Mojico Marins, who's known as um, Zede Cachao, Coffin Joe. He's probably come up already in the film series. Um, but he was essentially an autodidact, a kind of cinephile in the purest sense, because his father um, was a projectionist of a cinema. His mother sold snacks. So he literally grew up in the cinema, right? This is the, the primal scene. Um, and so he was very popular amongst the cinema marginal set, although he doesn't really share in the same, um, not quite in the same ethos and certainly not in the same sort of social formation that they did. And here we see him with I Ivan Cardoso. Um, the other reason um, the popular roots of film were so important for these artists um, was, of course, political. And as you know, these years overlapped with some of the most severe of Brazil's military dictatorship. Um, this is an image from Neville Dameda's Jajim de Guerra, which, among uh, other films, was censored, seen by very, very few people, um, though Elio Tisica did see this film, and it was sort of the root of um, their future collaboration. Um, the dictatorship, of course, made the question of political and social emancipation very, very urgent. The question of how one would link art to this emancipation, of course, was much, much less resolved. And in the 1960s, many people saw the kind of failure of previous efforts by um, a kind of middle class left wing intelligentsia to generate a popular revolutionary culture by essentially sort of imagining a, a top-down culture of ideologically sanctioned art. So this was a actually a, a total failure. And in 1969, um, the Brazilian critic Roberto Schwartz has this incredible and very penetrating analysis where he notes that the fact that huge segments of the working class welcomed the military dictatorship in 1964. And this was a kind of symptom and signal of the naivete of many of these middle class um, intellectuals who imagine this kind of um, top-down approach to culture, even though they imagined it as, as sort of coming from the, the working class themselves. So, you know, for many of the cinema marginal directors, including Dalmeda and Bressani, this, the quality of this film, this, this searching and subversive, even corrosive quality of the films, um, the desire to picture the underbelly of society, this gritty, raw, um, even inelegant use of the medium. These were all things that aligned their work in some, some form with the political imperatives of the marginal, the subaltern, um, the Brazilian underclass at large. But what I think is, for me, most interesting about these quotes is that they suggest that there is a level um, at, 
which goes beyond just sort of content, um, something more structural at play, um, an intimation and certainly a desire for emancipation to be brokered at the level of form, right? Um, and for me, what was useful to remember is um, in 1961, when 1961 is a kind of a moment when a lot of these initiatives from the, the left-wing uh, middle-class intelligence, just when they were most active, the poets, um, Haroldo de Campos, Augusto de Campos, and Desio Pignatari, who are the um, founders of the Brazilian um, concrete poetry movement, they had written in 1958 a um, pilot plan of concrete poetry. And in 1961, they added a line um, from Vladimir Mayakovsky, the, uh, the Soviet avant-garde poet, Without revolutionary form, there is no revolutionary art. So the idea that in 1961 they had to insist or wanted to insist on this point that you need to have a revolutionary form, not simply a content, is, is key. So apropos of this, I want to suggest um, that although the radical uh, experiments of um, experimental cinema and, and political emancipation seem very distant from each other, there is perhaps a way that we can find um, them meeting at the level of form, at the level of language, uh, its disintegration and its reconfiguration, if even in a manner that remained more or less illegible to the protagonist at the time. So how do we, how do we get there? Um, I mentioned that um, Harold de Campos was uh, discussing um, Bressani's film with Oitisika while the two were in New York. Um, Oitisika had arrived in New York in late 1970. He was living aloft in the East Village. Um, and this became an important site um, for Brazilian artists um, and intellectuals as they were coming through. And we see Oitisika here taking photos um, and Haroldo de Campos, the older poet, looking ahead at us. And on, the, um, on your right are a series of photos um, that Oitisika took on another visit of Haroldo and Carmen de Campos from 1972. Um, Oitisika had already become interested in film while he was living in Rio. Um, he participated as an actor in Global Hosha's Cancer. Actually, um, portions of that film were, were filmed in his um, front yard. And he became friends with people like um, Bressani, Ivan Cardoso da Almeida. And in 1970, um, after he returned from London and before he went to New York, he also made, um, he designed sets for this film, A Cangacera Electronica, by Antonio Carlos Fontura. Um, and when he moved to New York, he, he really threw himself into the film scene. This was what he was most excited about. Um, and he enrolled in a, uh, a film class at NYU, Introduction to Film Production. This was in February of 1971. And he visited places like Anthology Film Archives. And um, there's a kind of incredibly interesting comment that he has. Um, Anthology Film Archives had, um, had just put in this new uh, seating arrangement designed by Peter Kubelka called the Invisible Cinema. And the idea is that it kind of isolates the visual sense. Um, Kubelko called it a machine for seeing, and Oitisika really objected to it. And he wrote to Ivan Cardoso about this in February of 1971. So, I mean, he's just really arrived. Um, and he says, it's impossible to imagine how a new experimental form of seeing would emerge from this kind of claustrophobic environment. So, already in 1971, we can see that he's moving away from the idea that cinema um, is about a kind of film in a purist optical sense and really thinking about the spatiality um, and sociality of the filmic environment. Um, meanwhile, in 1971, in May, when they met, um, Haroldo Campos um, had arrived in New York from Austin. He was a visiting professor at the University of Texas. And um, Oitisika invited him to take part in a series of recorded conversations he was having with various people that he called Elio tapes. Um, and we see them in the midst of this conversation here, which took place on May 27th and 28th in the Chelsea Hotel. And we know from the transcription of these tapes that before they started their conversation, they had gone to see two Bressani films um, at the New Yorker Theater, um, Matoa Familia e Foi ao Cinema and Familia do Barulho. And Oitisika mentions a third, Memoirs of a Strangler of Blondes, which we'll see tonight, which he had not seen, but Augusto, I'm sorry, Haroldo de Campos had seen. And we also know from the end of uh, 
this transcription that, you know, at the very end of this conversation, when De Campos is talking about Bressani's film, Bressani himself calls the Chelsea Hotel. And I think this look of glee that you see in Elio Tzika's face is probably, he was like, take this picture now. Um, because just at that moment, then he decides to go to Bressani, who's at Globo Hasha's loft, and have a conversation with him that afternoon. So um, among the topics discussed by the Campos and Oitisica in their conversation is the Brazilian poet Joaquim Susandragi, who anticipated modern poetry, de Campos argues, in the 1870s by creating what he calls a mosaic or constellation um, of various kinds of citations, historical and mythological ones, elements of quotidian life he drew from newspaper fragments of newspapers, for example. Um, and de Campos compares this, what he calls brutal montage, to the intellectual approach of Mallarmé, whose poem, Un Coupe de Day, very famously, um, is a, supposed to have inaugurated modern poetry, um, but was written 20 years after Susan Draghi's um, The Inferno of Wall Street, which that poet wrote while he was also living in New York. Um, and in their conversation, Oitizika then extends the comparison, and he talks about the difference between the sensibilities of Godard, who he thinks represents the culmination of intellectual refinement, and Julia Bressani, who embodies what Oitizika suggests is, is some sort of crucial Brazilian difference. And then Ducampos locates this difference in this anthropophagic drive towards appropriation. Oitisika then says that this kind of drive, this impulse, actually permeates all of Brazilian um, media. And at this point, de Campos cites the sort of circus-like atmosphere of the popular television show um, hosted by Chacrinha. Difficult to <laughs> translate if you haven't seen him. Um, but one of the interesting things that de Campos says is that Chacrinha's um, television show operates by a metonymic logic, um, this kind of fragmented uh, language of single gestures. So for example, he touches this giant dial that's around his neck as if to stand in for entire processes of communication. So according to de Campos, Chacrinha understands that television is a fragmented medium, and he deliberately exploits this quality. So he, as de Campos says, makes avant-garde art at the level of popular culture. So this is not some sort of a primitive sensibility, it's a vanguard one. Um, at this point, de Campos and Oitisica take a break from their conversation, so I'll note here um, First, that the two are very interested in identifying aspects of media praxis that are at once both highly self-reflexive and uniquely Brazilian. So Chacrinha's constant and brutal use of the medium of television, as de Campos puts it. Um, and two, that de Campos, his introduction to Cisandraje, to Oitisica, ultimately served as inspiration for this um, Super 8 film or project, um, which we, we can see tomorrow, Agatha Pina e Homa Manhattan, which he shoots um, the following year. Um, this film is unfinished, so it's difficult to extrapolate exactly what Oitisika would have imagined from it. But from the roles of film that we have, we can see, or I think we can see, that he um, adopts a kind of um, fragmentary, impre impressionistic view on the city um, that aligned um, with Susan Draghi's aesthetics. But his most radical experiments with this, this idea of a, a fragment or mosaic or constellation depart even further from this film. And for this, we have to return now to the second part of the conversation, which happens the following day. Um, so on this day, Haroldo de Campos returns to the question of Bressani's films, and specifically Memoirs of a Strangler of Blondes, which we remember Oitisica has not seen at this point. Um, and I don't actually know if he ever did see it. But de Campos describes it this way. He says, it's a kind of elimination of the rhetoric, of the verbalism, this thing that, in my view, infects much of Brazilian cinema novo. He goes on, um, Bressani's film has the great advantage of totally eliminating verbal discourse. The film maintains an extraordinary humor. In the end, what is being strangled by the film, by the strangler of blondes, is the verbal rhetoric of cinema. In reality, it is film whose ultimate motivation is cinema, but not treated from an intellectualized point of view, but from a direct point of view, as if it was taking possession of the innards of cinema, strangling it in the act. So again, de Campos is interested in this 
highly self-reflexive form of medial engagement that bypasses a certain intellectualism in favor of a very direct visual address. And de Campo suggests that he achieves this through this kind of repetition until exhaustion, um, and you will see this, <laughs> believe me, be it the color of the hair of the blonde or the, you know, the act of strangulation. He also points out moments um, which he creates uh, what the compass calls a veritable visual ideogram through visual associations, and he points in particular to a sequence of a, a shower drain. Um, and these ideograms short circuit the necessity for discursive explanation because they don't have to be translated. They're eloquent on their own, de Campos argues. Now, um, this film um, was actually the first film that Bressani made when he moved to London. So for him, as well as for Oitisica and de Campos, translation was this quotidian experience. Right? Um, translation is very important for Oitisika. He actually worked um, the graveyard shift at a translation company called All Language for a while in New York, which is very interesting um, that this was a form of making money right by the hour. Um, but it also appears in his own and, of course, um, the Campos's work um, as a kind of field of experimentation. They were both very deeply committed to the materialities of language. Um, this uh, is an example of, of a sort of participatory theater piece that he wrote while he was living in London. Um, London is a time period in which he first starts to think about making films, but also when he starts to mix languages, um, and that practice would intensify even more in New York. In this case, um, it's only in English, um, but you can see that there's this uh, visual and sonic um, juxtaposition. The idea is that each color would be a different voice, and so they kind of reverberate or, or perhaps more apropos, they rub up against one another in this libidinous way. Um, and so it generates meaning by virtue of how they play off one another. Um, on the right, meanwhile, um, are pages from a poem book called Calidio Scapo that was created by Geraldo's brother, Augusto de Campos, in 1971. And this was um, inspired by the portmanteau words in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Um, and so how this works is that Basically, this is an unbound book. It's about this big. And so you can move the pages about along the fold and make up these new words um, or create other words. Um, and they play with different um, elements of, of various languages. And um, it seems that um, Haroldo de Campos gave Oitusika a copy of this book because we see it here photographed in this same um, series of 1972 shots. And I'll come back to this later. Um, just, just one other thing to note that in 1972 as well, so probably right after these shots were taken, Oitisika proposes from New York um, a, a participatory event for the University of Sao Paulo in which he says Augusto de Campos should use the same method but holding up big placards so that the audience members would then make words. But to return to 1971 and this question of translation, what seems to be most interesting for de Campos and Oitisika is that in Bressani's film, you could bypass translation altogether, um, and in this sense, bypass discourse, right? Um, Oitisika notes the use of black leader in some of Bressani's earlier films, and he says that it's a pause that has a kind of structural significance, but also a symbolic significance. Um, so if de Campo suggests that Bressani grasps the innards of cinema through the directness of these visual ideograms, Oitisika would seem to add here that he, he's laying bare its bones, right, by revealing the materiality of the celluloid um, and according this materiality as cinematic value. So at this point in the conversation, um, Bresani calls the Chelsea Hotel and Oitisika arranges to meet him at Globahasha's loft and he interviews them. So here we see that the A side is Haroldo de Campos and the B side is Julia Bresani. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, I was so excited when I found this in the archive. You know, as anybody who looks in Oitisika's archive, you're just always, there's always a million things to, to find. Um, in this case, however, the conversation is mostly small talk, although Oitisika sort of launches off with this question, do you think cinema has a specific path, un camino, sort of like a way forward, which is very provocative, but it never really goes into this kind of intense um, 
analysis that um, de Campos's um, conversation had. Nevertheless, it was a result of that conversation that um, Bressani returned to Oitisica um, to collaborate with him um, later in 1971, so in August of 1971, in which, at which time they shot, or Bressani shot, um, footage for this film called Lagrima Pantera that he edited the following year. Um, and much of this is shot in um, Oitisica's loft, and we can hopefully return to this in the, in the Q&A. But for the purposes now, what I think we can garner from these um, transcripts in 1971 is that de Campos's description of Bressani's film um, seems to have planted certain seeds in Oitisica's thinking about the question of cinema and language and the particularities of Brazilian use of media and film and television. And these are elements that he continued to explore in the following months. Around April or May of 1971, um, he goes to one of these legendary performances by Jack Smith. Um, and in these, Jack Smith projected films, um, interacted with people, sorry, projected slides um, as he was interacting with the audience and manipulating objects, many of which were from his own films. And Otisika was apparently electrified by this, and he first uses the term quasi-cinema in relationship to this performance by Smith. Um, around this time, he also meets Mario Montes, who had been um, an actor um, in both Warhol's and Jack Smith's film, and um, Montes appears then in Otisika's Agrippina Home of Manhattan the following year. So we, he, he's really delving into the experimental film scene in New York while maintaining this very rigorous um, exchange with his Brazilian interlocutors. Um, by November of 1971, his thinking about film becomes even more theoretical, and this is um, partially a result of his reading of McLuhan's Understanding Media. Um, McLuhan famously asserted that the content of any medium is always another medium, right? So the content of speech, uh, sorry, the content of writing is speech, uh, the content of print is writing, the content of the telegram is print, and so on and so on, right? So new mediums contain older mediums within them, but at content rather than form or structure. And what McLuhan is most interested in is the formal or structural capacities of a medium. And he understands that they, these formal and structural capacities have distinct modalities or intensities of sensory address. So um, a hot medium like print engages the sight, um, the sense of sight with this very high density of information as opposed to a cool medium which is structured around informational gaps and thus requ requires more participation in order for communication to occur. And so one of his examples here is the telephone, right? You have to go back and forth in order for anything to happen. Um, for McLuhan, <clears throat> television was a cool medium as opposed to the hotness of film. This may seem counterintuitive, but if we think of the dis distinction between the silent spectatorship of a movie theater versus the highly social and interactive character of television, but also the distinction between a kind of celluloid projection, high density, right, as opposed to um, um, cathode tubes radiating um, rays from behind this mesh of the television screen, we can get a sense of what he was after. In any case, whether we agree with these or not, nowadays, they made a huge impression upon Oitisika. And um, in this uh, letter to Cardoso, it's actually six or seven pages long, but the, the crucial part is here. He notes that he was reading McLuhan and conveys to him um, elements of his analysis of film as a literate art. Um, and he translates excerpts uh, for Cardoza. Um, so this is McLuhan, translated by Oitisika. Movies as a nonverbal form of experience are like photography, a form of statement without syntax. In fact, however, like print and photo, movies assume a high level of literacy in their viewers and prove baffling to the non-literate. So then Oitizika goes on in his own voice. Um, soon after, McLuhan imagines a hypothesis which would be cinema without linear sequence, like a newspaper, where the news appears side by side in a montage. This idea of the cinema newspaper as a montage is, in my view, what Haroldo de Campos wants to insinuate when he says that Giulio Bressani seeks to strangle the verbal language of cinema, in my view, a fascinating hypothesis. So here, Oitizika is connecting these two analyses. He's intimating first that the content of Bressani's film does indeed correspond to these verbal structures, but rather than maintain the linearity of print, 
um, which in a McLoonian analysis is what um, the logical content of film does, right? Bressani strangles this anachronistic verbal rhetoric. Um, and the result of this is a residual textuality, but now fragmented by virtue of montage. Um, so Oitisika is suggesting that Bressani had actually arrived at this hypothetical medial form that McLuhan imagines. But he doesn't stop here, and he writes to Cardoza of McLuhan's description of the cool implosion of television that follows from the hot explosion of cinema. He writes, the linearity of the cinematographic sequence is superseded by the mosaic pattern of TV. And then he queries, for us then, what does this mean? And I think us, for him at this point, is this circle of um, poets and artists and, and directors associated with the cinema machinelle. And he says that the cinema seeks to concentrate itself specifically in its medium in order to survive. In some, it seeks to exist in another form that is no longer connected to the typographic linearity it inherited from its beginnings. This actually sounds very Greenbergian, if there are any art historians out there. Um, TV, meanwhile, <clears throat> This is Oitisika, reinstates the participation of the spectator in contrast to the pure visual hypnotism of silent films. What happens in my view is that cinema attempts more and more to supplant the rival of television, which is participatory for the spectator. Um, and we should note here that Oitisika is choosing to use the word cinema here rather than film, right? So already that's shifting our comprehension of what it would mean to kind of concentrate itself. So we're not talking about concentrating on a filmic quality, but rather a cinematic quality, which of course includes not simply a projection, um, but the entire environment in which that projection occurs. So to summarize, Oitisika extrapolates from McLuhan that first film carries with it an older linear sequencing of text, which assumes a relatively passive viewer who merely follows the temporal sequence as it has been edited. Um, second, that in the wake of the more participatory medium of TV, cinema is forced to compete with this new medium and does so by leaving aside its previous alignment with textual literacy in order to concentrate on its own qualities as cinema. And third, and here he's extrapolating from, from De Campos, that certain films of Brazilian cinema machinal had already arrived at this new medial phrase by strangling the previous verbality. So Oitisika was certainly thinking um, not only of Bressani, but other Brazilian filmmakers like Neville de Almeida. Um, and in 1974, Oitisika noted um, a particular sequence of Jacin de Guerra that he was uh, really impressed by. And this sequence is composed only of still shots of posters. And the rectangular format of these posters then has this kind of resonance with the rectangular frame of the screen. The screen. Um, and he also sees elements of this at work in Mangi Bangi, which was composed as a series of single takes. Um, Oitisika writes, uh, as a result, in Mangi Bangi, um, a film is fragmented into geometrically encapsulated episodes as if a sequence taken from a comic book. Um, he also wrote in 1974 for an introductory text on Mangi Bangi for Khan. Um, Mangi Bangi is a limit exactly because by not holding to the former cinema function form, at the same time by not proposing new ways or solutions for the movies, it makes cinema into an instrument similar to what functions in TV. So um, these films clearly constitute for Oitisika retooling of the filmic medium. And if Memoirs of a Strangler of Blondes strangles this verbal language, Mangi Bangi explodes it into slides, fragments as a consequence, as he writes. Now, the fact that he, <coughs> excuse me, writes that Mangi Bangi um, is a limit case because it explodes filmic language into slides in 1974 is very, um, it's very specific, right? Because in 1973, he and Dalmeida had themselves invented this new form of an expanded cinema of slides altogether. So by doing this, he's creating this kind of genealogy between uh, films like Memoirs of a Strangler of Blondes and the Cosmococas. So again, um, these new kinds of, um, this new filmic environment occurs essentially in a place like this. This is a picture of Oitisika's loft um, from around 1974. Um, Oitisika and Dalmeida called these new um, quasi-cinemas cosmococas because their muse was um, nothing less than cocaine. 
Um, and this was um, surely a defining factor in the generation of the works, but also their intended consumption. And as we see from these sequences, there's usually, I would say, around 30, 35, correct me if I'm wrong, slides in any given cosmococca. Um, and the visual conceit is um, these shifting patterns of cocaine that are distributed across these flat surfaces, in this case, um, uh, of uh, Hendrix record cover. And then these are projected on the walls and ceiling of a space from multiple carousels, and there's a soundtrack that also comes. Now, Max Hinderer Cruz, who has um, contributed to the series, has written very eloquently, I think, um, in particular about the, um, the cultural and political resonances of cocaine in these works and others. Um, and these range from the Incan use of the coca leaves to Freud's obsession with a drug, right? And the, you know, even the, the transgressive impulse of picturing and using this substance. Um, I don't have time to rehearse all of that. He's really done a wonderful job um, at discussing this. But I just want to insist on the fact that, that cocaine is not an incidental element. Um, to the content of these projected slides, nor the presumed transformations that would occur for um, somebody who is interacting in this environment, right? There's a behavioral charge, and behavior is, in fact, key to these works. Um, the scripts for the cosmococcus include instructions for specific kinds of environments, so um, mattresses or hammocks, a pool even in one case. Um, and so what we see here is Oitisika and Dalmeida entirely transforming um, the kind of black box of the cinema in which we sit right now, right? Um, in this kind of setup, the viewer's presence is assumed, but it's never acknowledged. And so it transforms this into this dynamic participatory environment in which spectators are located literally within the film. And again, um, these you know, could be entirely on their own, just the subject of another lecture. But I just want to make two points that pertain to the quality of cinema machinelle films as media propositions. And the first pertains to exactly what kind of medial transformation Oitisika and Dalmeida affected here. Um, as we see from these slides from the first of the Cosmococcus called Trash Escapes, um, Oitisika and Dalmeida remain extremely self-reflexive in their interrogation of film and filmic tradition, right? And so here we see them using cocaine um, to perform this very famous cut in Luis Buñuel's Un Chien Andalou, which of course analogizes the cinematographic cut, right? Now, the horror of Buñuel's film, I'm sure you've all seen this little um, sequence, depends on the fact that the, the edited frames continue. Um, Oitisika and Dalmeida, of course, do the opposite. They break apart the continuity of um, this temporal sequence and isolate these individual photographic frames. And Oitisika calls them moment frames and spatializing them in the environment. So they break with precisely that typographic linearity that McLuhan um, observed in film and associated with, on the one hand, the literacy of print, and on the other hand, the passivity of the viewer. So in the Cosmococcus, um, Oitisika and Dalmeida unlock the temporal and spatial components of filmic illusion and reveal them as a set of discrete combinatory elements that are material, constructed, and manipulable. So there's a radical um, cooling down or um, deliterization of, of the filmic medium um, in the wake of its strangulation by Bressani and explosion by Dalmeida. And this cooling down, in the McLuhanian sense, produces these gaps which incite spectator participation. Um, and the temporal continuity, which was previously accorded to the projected filmic image, is now given over to the viewer, who experiences these constellated fragments of the filmic language now in their own embodied time. So cinema is reconstituted as a container for embodied behavior in which the representational status of the image is shared with the bodies of the participants. And you can see here how the, the shadows of the participants um, partake in what we might call kind of diegetic content, you know, expanded outwards. Um, <clears throat> Also, I think it's important to note that there's the things that are pictured in the Cosmococca slides are always flat, and so there's a relation to between what's projected and the materiality of the wall on which we see it. Um, in his conversation with Bressani on May, uh, May 28, 1971, Oitisika noted that it made no sense to talk about 
um, underground Brazilian filmmakers. This, of course, was a lingo that was used underground, or udi grudi, for these cinema marginal um, directors. He says that it makes no sense because all Brazilian culture is underground, which is to say marginal, subterranean, which is another of Oitacica's key terms, um, operating under the weight of the, the so-called underdeveloped um, as lar at large. And this brings me to the final point about the cinematic retooling at work in the Cosmococas, which is um, if we can comprehend experiments like these, which take place really at the very limits of social and aesthetic legibility, um, can we comprehend them in light of this idea, um, this political notion or politicized notion that in Brazil all culture is underground? If this is true, can we also locate a kind of emancipatory logic um, of rendering cinema and alphabetic, as it were. And here I just want to return to these series of shots that Oitisica took of Augusto de Campos' 1972 book, um, Calidioscapo, which I mentioned have these loose pages so they can be recombined to make different um, words. Um, there is no evidence of their contact whatsoever um, or influence, but what is really um, remarkable about this technique that both Acosta Campos used and then Oitisica inspired by him is that um, it has an extraordinary affinity with the uh, literacy techniques of the Brazilian ed educator Paulo Freire, who is um, most well known for his 1968 book, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, on the right, I'm showing you an image from of this technique used um, in practice in the 1960s. Um, Freire first began to experiment with this technique in the early 1960s, and it, it was such a success that by 1962, the Brazilian government decided to implement it um, on a large scale. Of course, this uh, program was quickly, quickly shut down by the uh, military dictatorship as soon as they came into office in 1964, since they took control. And Paulo Freire went into exile. And from 1969 to 1970, he was actually teaching at Harvard. Um, one of the most important things about Freire's technique was that the process of alphabetization, the process of literacy, came with a process he called conscientization, or becoming politically con conscious. And this was a term of his own making as well, and I think that's important. Um, so what he did was to start with a work like tijolo, uh, which means brick. Um, so a, a word that has a lot of resonance with a particular population that he's working with, uh, um, uh, who's working in the city, for example, or in a rural experience. Um, and the workshop participants would discuss this word in terms of their own experience. Then he would show the word broken apart into syllables, and then he would diagram these syllables in terms of each phonemic family. So you have ta, ti, ti, to, tu, ja, ji, ji, jo, ju, and so on and so forth. So um, basically this is to teach the principle of phonemic combination. And so what the participants do is that they make up different combinations of these syllables, um, and they create as many combinations as they can, even if the result is nonsense words. Um, so this technique is anticipating precisely what Ocosa de Campos would then do in 1972. Um, and this moment of, of, of free play at which you're making these syllabic combinations is very important for Freire in terms of this conscientisation because it locates the participant literally within language, right? It shows that they can be agents within language. They don't just receive it, which um, he called the kind of banking notion of education that you simply receive information, you, you give it back to someone else who owns it, right? But that you actually generate it. Um, and it's only after this mechanism of verbal generation is, is absorbed that you move on to making actual words. And I think this is just amazing because from this simple word tijolo, you can practically make the sentence you already read, right? It's really beautiful. Um, now, <clears throat> although members of the Cinema Marginal group Augusto Haroldo de Campos um, and Paulo Freire 
you could say in a very broad sense that they both embrace the idea of a kind of social transformation or even revolution, the political praxis of these protagonists couldn't be more different, right? Fideri was a socialist. He followed liberation theology. For Oitisika, liberation was really something more connected to a kind of freedom from um, sexual conformity, um, more, you know, not class consciousness per se. Um, Fideri had this kind of Christian Marxist teleology of revolution. Oitisika's interest in time was to produce a kind of non-instrumentalized time. He actually had a term for this he called cre lazach or cre leisure, which is a combination of, in Portuguese and English, um, creativity, leisure, laziness, belief, right? Um, and this idea of cre lazach was exactly the kind of time that he wanted to mobilize in his cosmococcus. So, you know, they really are um, completely on, on different sort of tracks politically. But nevertheless, at the level of structure of language and its fragmentation, there is this kind of remarkable um, affinity. The idea that you have to deconstruct elements of a given language, be it fil filmic or verbal, and locate the participant literally in its parts in order to inhabit the possibility of its transformation. Um, and here, um, I just think that's kind of lovely that in Saussure's course of general linguistics, he diagrams the sound chain, the idea that one sound kind of moves on to another in what looks exactly like a film strip, OK? And with both the Cosmococos and Paulo Freire, this film strip, this sound chain, is exactly what is exploded, what is pulled apart and spatialized in a room in order for the participant to take hold of its various parts. Um, Freire, of course, the idea was to kind of install the participant within language and then kind of reintegrate right, him into society. This is very different than Oitisik and Almeida, who imagined reinventing language altogether. But nevertheless, at this kind of one moment, some, somehow they meet. Finally, <laughs> to bring this back in a kind of roundabout way um, to Bressani's Memoirs of a Strangler of Blondes, I want to recall that um, Jean-Louis Baudry's highly influential text, The Ideological Effects of the Basic Cinematographic Apparatus, was first published in 1970 and came out in its English edition in 1974, so precisely in these years. Um, this is um, surely a case of another, you know, ships passing in the night. I don't have any evidence that Oitisika read Baudry. It doesn't really matter in this case. Um, but I think it bears, um, at least theoretically, on this question of cinema marginal as a limit case. Um, the principle of Baudry's theory um, was that the cinematographic apparatus, and by this he means the darkened cinema, the light that's projected from behind, the luminous screen, the immobilized viewer, the reality effect that occurs by the temporal continuity of all these disconnected frames, the depth of field that occurs um, within these uh, photographic frames. In other words, all of the elements that Oitisika and Almeida pull apart and spatialize in the Cosmococcus. Baudry argues that all of those elements together create a scenario in which the spectator forgets that the cinematographic apparatus exists, that filmic illusion is produced. At the same time as the spectator, and we can call him he, um, identifies with the camera. Um, and so to this extent, the uh, apparatus becomes a perfect vehicle for the reproduction of dominant ideology at the level of the psychic constitution of the subject um, because it replicates the mirror stage of the child. Um, the mirror stage, this, he's pulling from Lacan here, is um, the pre-verbal stage in which the child can only imagine his fragmented sensations as unified um, when he sees the specular image of the reflection or, and this is also interesting, in a kind of misidentification in his mother, who through his, the imagination, he kind of imagines himself as whole through her eyes. She assures him of his, the image of his body. Um, at the level of content, um, in Bressani's film, I think we have a tale of a, a kind of mirror stage gone wrong. Um, and if, as I have suggested, that what is exploded in Oitisika's and Dalmena's Cosmococcus is precisely the elements of the basic cinematographic apparatus, what kinds of subjectivities, microsubjectivities, or intersubjectivities can we imagine re being reinvented from the analphabetic fragments that appear in its wake? So thank you. And I look forward to your discussion after this.
Thank you so much, Irene, for this fascinating introduction. It was really amazing. I will have a very short pause, and then we're going to have the screening of the film. Thank you. So there was uh, one short video that Irene wanted to show, and she mentioned that she could perhaps show it right now. Uh, so we'll see if that works out. Um, it's a short clip. So, um, you know, one thing we might talk about is um, if, you know, the kind of discussion that Oitisiko is having with Harold de Campos um, and others had a kind of effect on the cinema marginal um, figures. And um, so I can talk about this more later, but I was just taking oh, advantage of your absence <laughs> to try and show. Yeah, you can just, it's without sound. Um, just a couple minutes, um, and we can return to this or not, but um, of this uh, film that Bressani made um, in, 19, in August of 1971, mostly in Oitisika's loft. Um, and there are these moments here where there's projected, um, a projected slide or Super 8 on, on top of figures. Um, and it kind of goes on, I'll just fast forward a little bit here. But just to show you potentially um, what might have come in the wake of the kinds of conversations that were happening. And then here's another one. So this is um, within these nests that Oitisika um, made in his loft. And so we see the television, the kind of film of this netting that he hung between them. That's sort of Oitisika in the background. and the sort of presumption of this film in a very, very loose sense is this kind of discussion of a, a potential bank robbery, it seems. So this is a map where bank is. <laughs> OK, we can stop that there. Um. I want to talk about animal sounds. <laughs> uh, I mean, th th this this is one uh, one of the consistent features of the cinema marginal films: uh, sound montage. Um, rhythm is a big issue always in all these films, uh, but there's a lot of sampled music, as we would now say, uh, that that is uh, worked into the soundtrack. Um, there's not a single line of dialogue here. The only uh, you know, articulated human language that we have is writing at the beginning and in the end. But then there are these animal sounds. There's uh, elephants, monkeys, frogs, dogs. Did I miss something? Any? Dinosaur? Dinosaurs. <laughs> Yeah. What, what, what are we supposed to make of these in the light of your <laughs> argument that we're talking well, about an, an alphabetical cinema? Yeah, here? Harold is a compass. This is one of the things that he notes that the soundtrack is was made in the zoo and that he makes these recordings in a zoo and brings them in. Um, I mean, I think that this is obviously a film that's about regression. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that was useful for me to think about in terms of Oitisikas and Dalmeda's um, quasi cinemas is this notion that you know Freud has, where we, you know, as animals, this our sense of smell is the most important. As we elevate into civilization, we we you know we go on two feet, and our sense of sight becomes the most important. So if cinema is aligned with a sense of sight, um, and the cosmococas are aligned with the nose, you want to see with your nose if you're going to be in a cocaine cinema. There is a conscious a kind of regression that's happening here. And of course, with the scenes of the baby and this, you know, the problem that emerges early on, <laughs> right, um, we're meant to think of this as a kind of regressive scenario. Of course, we're always repeating the same problem. Um, but also, um, what would happen if we imagine subjectivity being built otherwise mm -hmm. in a more creaturely way, perhaps. Um, and Laura was mentioning, and I think um, watching this the second time around, um, uh, it's even more clear 
the kind of little citations that happen, mostly black and white. Um, and these are to three, if maybe four, of um, Bressani's earlier films. Mm -hmm. So there's O Anjo Nasceu, um, uh, Matou a Familia, killed the family and went to the cinema, which is an important one. And then the, sort of the, the, the troublesome family, Familia de Borulio. And those are kind of cut in. And so one thing is that all of those films deal with a kind of Oedipal problem mm. in some ways and how to kind of exit that scenario with, you know, kill the families and went to the movies. The character kills his parents who are squabbling watching TV and then they go to the cinema. So... You know, in some ways, this is, is is a kind of you know we have to kind of kill off this Oedipal scenario in a, in order we have to regress in order to kind of reimagine. Um, I think what's interesting here, if we read this through De Campos's lens, is that in those earlier films, um, particularly killed the family and went to the cinema. The family is you know both a kind of the facade of, of a bourgeois Brazilian um, scenario. I mean, not, not just bourgeois, actually, um, but the kind of Brazilian family. But of course, also, you know, the father, as the military dictatorship understood itself to be, you know, the disciplinarian father. So that family had to be killed. And um, Matua Familia Foi o Cinema includes a quite extensive steen of torture. Um, which, you know, if you think 1969, this is just after, you know, this act passed, um, the AI-5. Um, but here, if De Campos is right in the sense that Bressani is trying to strangle the verbal language of cinema, that not only that family had to be killed off, but the sort of media, the, mm. the, the cinematic father. Um, and so, you know, I think this is sort of question, like what, what you know, what's the status of cinema really here? Yeah, I mean, if if you want to read it in Lacanian terms, um, the father, of course, is the symbolic, the symbolic and and uh, so eliminating language from that. Uh, from the, the symbolic film. being the entry into language, right? This right, is where the discipline of the father and ideology bears down. Um, one of the interesting things that he brought up is is uh, Ido Jessica's, um rejection of of the of Peter Kubelko's. Um, the, yeah, the, the machine for seeing, and um, in the light of what you just said, it, 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 you know, one one way of reading that rejection is that that it really moves us towards the disembodied cerebral transcendentalist uh, end of of that particular development, and and what he's interested in is actually the, the contrary, regressing or recuperating the sense of smell and recuperating, reintegrating the sense of sight with with other sights. Mm -hmm. um, so as I understand it, you would read the animal sounds as sort of indicators of that regression. Yeah. Or yeah. of a desire for regression. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and um, so this, this little film, this clip that I showed you, um, I am indebted here to this young scholar, um, Teo Duarte, um, whose work I encountered. He's just finishing his PhD at Universidade de Sao Paulo, and he gave a really great paper at this Oitisica conference last year on this um, Bressani film that um, very few people knew about. I mean, it was sort of discovered and, and reconfigured in 2006, which is sort of why. But... Um, what Bressani says about it is that Oitisica had shown him not his Cosmococos because they hadn't been invented yet, but um, his Super 8 um, film strips. And we have to remember that Oitisica was not a filmmaker. He was trying to learn how to become one. And Bressani found him quite sort of primitive um, in his use. Like he's like, he doesn't know how to do this or that. But Bressani was fascinated by it. And he says that it was a kind of search for an image, an image that would be a cinema outside of cinema. And so La Grama Pantera, this little film that Bressani shot, he describes it as a kind of impression of the, an impression of what he felt Oitisica's impressions were of trying to find a cinema. So that's Bressani trying to kind of regress in terms of his practical skills mm. as a filmmaker to recover a kind of rawness, a sort of primitive quality to reimagine it. And what Teo Duarte um, argues in his research 
is that one of the things that Bressani learns from Oitesika is n to think less of cinema as a product and more as a process. Mm -hmm. And so the filmmaker and cinema in general is meant to be an instrument. It's a prompt for behavior rather than anything else. So the kind of scenes you see here are scenes that are, um, it's two women in this case. I mean, um, they're, they're, behavior is sort of prompted by the presence of the camera and perhaps that sort of experimentalism of behavior is more important than the actual product. So, I mean, if we kind of go back to what I was trying to argue in terms of creating these um, kind of units that can be recombined, um, if we think of these cinematic takes and these sort of cinematic prompts for behavior as kind of behavioral blocks that can mm -hmm. be reconfigured, we can try and reconfigure both a kind of um, subjectivity, but also a kind of thinking about how to be differently, how to inhabit public space differently. Oitisika was fascinated by um, the Black Panthers and, and um, the Gay Pride Parade. I mean, when he was there, it was one of the first in 1970 or 1971, I think it was the first Gay Pride Parade. So the idea that you would sort of embody and produce and perform your subjectivity in public, as this is coming into being in the you know in its very first stance, th this was something that he wanted to document in his cinema as well. L latching on to that, um, two things I found interesting is location and and duration in in the film. Uh, location, I mean, it's a film that was shot in London. Uh, Bresani had to go into exile, uh, but it it really it it's a, it's a. Let's put it this way: it's a very long film, so it picks up on. I mean, it, it works. It it it, it uses the, the location to great effect, but it also um, works with certain stereotypes connected to London, like the serial killer. He's sort of a Jack the Ripper type mm -hmm. figure. Uh, his attire, the um, the moustache, the way he handles the moustache, like very nineteenth century, sort of a, a Victorian. Uh, you know, throwback to uh, <clears throat> to the nineteenth century. The, the final shots, of course, where he's where the mise en scène suggests he's this great writer. Um, you know, and the the declining years with with the sight lights and everything. Uh, so there there are these uh, references to to nineteenth century iconography and but also nineteenth century popular culture. Um, and then you said blocks of behavior. I, I really like that. Uh, term um, in a way there's I mean there's there's a, a temporal framework because uh, the whole thing is a flashback or can be construed to be a flashback we see him writing a line in the in the beginning and it closes with him writing again and it starts off with the baby and it sort of progresses through his career as a serial killer um, but but there's no progression really <laughs> it's it's just yeah <laughs> Which I loved. Um, uh, it's 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 really just a, a, a repetition of the same set piece, uh, and and it's it, in a way it's super minimalist because he's always wearing these ridiculous red trousers. He also has red underwear, of course, um, socks <coughs> and socks, and and uh, um, so so it's 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 very reductive, very very minimalist, and and in the light of what you just said, you know that. What Ochisika inspired him in him was a desire to become primitive again. Um, uh, it, it's very elementary. It's very um, uh, basically deconstructing the, the the biographical narrative that it suggests. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this idea, you know, this kind of repetition. Obviously, there is a there kind of a psychoanalytic reason for repetition compulsion, <laughs> but there's also an economy of means. If you can't pay very many actors and you're just pulling in your three blonde friends to over and over and over <laughs> again perform this, I mean, it's all it's a different kind of aesthetics of hunger, let's say. Um, and I think you know one of the it's a very cheap film. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I I find sort of interesting about this film and um, especially in comparison to, you know, thinking about it with Oitisika, whose aesthetic is so much more um, queer and material and performative, I would say, um, is that allegory is in some ways the kind of hasaka, the, the, you know, the holdover, the hangover of Cinema Novo. Like in Cinema Novo, 
allegory like works. And then as we get into cinema marginal, right, it becomes much more like the way Benjamin understands allegory as just fragments, ruins. Like, and here you cannot get out of it, right? And the woman allegory is trap. Yes, the woman has to repeat over and over and over again, and she has she becomes the shot itself as she becomes the cinema viewer. You know, just on every single park, she's sort of contemplating nothing, immobilized, despite you know what would be screams of her fellow blondes behind her, right? Um, and then. You know, with Oitisika, I mean, this, you know, there's nothing sort of allegorical. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess that maybe I would take that back because there's this kind of um, self-reflexive aspect of, of the Cosmococcus. But I think um, one of the things that's sort of interesting is moving forward into, you know, maybe some of what we'll look at tomorrow is this notion that um, that subjectivity is performed and embodied in its performance rather than inhabiting a role already. And we see that, I think, with his interest in Mario Montez, but also this um, slideshow or, or, or um, non-narrative um, quasi-cinema called um, Elena Inventa Maria Angelica. Angela Maria. <laughs> so, which is an actress, Elena, who is inventing, um, embodying this kind of 1950s Brazilian film star. Um, and it's these series of shots over and over again. Um, so I think, you know, that this question of allegory is also a kind of trap that needed to be itself strangled mm -hmm. yep. to get out of, you know, so that we can explore different um, ways of producing movies. Um, uh, duration was an, another thing that I, that I found interesting. One of, one of the most fascinating scenes is the one, one where he's standing in the kitchen, like with yeah. his... I can't Tree hold pose. position. Somebody in here, it, 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 it has to be some, some kind of new age type of meditation technique Okay, <laughs> uh, that I'm not familiar with, but it, 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 it seemed familiar. And then uh, he just holds it for the length of a song and then a little bit more. Um, it's an interesting way of, of creating rhythm uh, in the film. Uh, I don't know if you have something to say on that particular moment or the the kind of you know sometimes it's just the duration of a song of a song or a musical motive that structures the length of the shot i mean i i don't think i have anything eloquent <laughs> to say <laughs> i would just say as a spectator that moment comes as a great relief and joy mm -hmm. i mean you're you feel he's broken out and and i can too i'm tired of watching this strangling you know over and over again um and of, of course then we kind of go back to the same but um it's also i mean i guess a kind of moment where you really see oh this is what cinema does so well you know to match the song and this kind of moment as this cathartic release that then is you know taken away from you once again so i guess that was that's just in my experience yeah. as a, as i know it's, viewer. It, i mean it's definitely a pure cinematic moment it's like one yeah. of those things where you say okay yeah uh, he's a filmmaker, um, <laughs> and and then there's there's one last little detail that that struck me, and I wondered if you had any thoughts of this, which is the the shot since you brought up Lacan and the mirror stage, um, the shot of the mirror laying in some kind of woodwork, mm -hmm. and at first it's empty, and then you have the two actors, and then they disappear again. Yeah, that, I just thought that was a really. Well, I mean, there's like, I mean, there's there's so many moments of that actually. There's many mirrors that appear. There's one, um, the rear view mirror of a car, um, or the side mirror of a car, um, and then he's refracted several times. And I think, you know, also uh, the shot of the drain, which is meant to be the you know visual ideogram of strangulation, right? From there, it becomes a peephole, which is also old cinema. So all of these are techniques. I mean, I was almost thinking this is a kind of, you know, it's Hitchcock in the sense of, you know, there's these little tropes that are, are hyper symbolic mm -hmm. within a cinematic tradition and a Freudian psychoanalytic tradition, for example. Um, and so I think if we didn't think so already, I mean, I don't know who's watching this film really, except for cinephiles. <laughs> Even then, this is a movie about cinema and about um, about thinking about those those problems. So. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, Danny, please. Um, hi, yeah, just following up from that. I mean, I like the idea of regression and 
this kind of like interest cinematic regression that it's going back to these kind of earlier modes of cinema. Obviously, it's a silent film with no spoken dialogue. I mean, silent in quotes, no spoken dialogue at least. Um, and also, I mean, it's going back to like pre-1908 cinema, really, just this kind of series of attraction moments, you know, like these just strangulations but no kind of narrative progress in any real sense. But on the other hand, I mean, there's that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I mean, I didn't find it a very primitivist film because the mise-en-scene is spectacularly composed. I mean, this is really, really well kind of framed and composed scenes. I mean, the whole... Um, there's, I, I really found this really stunning, um, those scenes in the park with these kind of multiple planes of kind of, um, not action per se, but, you know, at least multiple planes of kind of uh, on-screen events. Um, so, I, f I mean, th that seems to me kind of countervailing the idea of kind of primitivism of this going, you Sorry, know. Sorry, I, I meant when that he tries to adopt a primitive, a sort of, less refined aesthetic when he does the other... The lagrima. Oh, okay, okay, yes. all right. Not this. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this film is like, there's, yeah, as Vincent was saying, there's real a cinematic mentality here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, that's just a small second question. I don't know if it was the physiognomy of the actor, but it seemed to give the film a kind of Dostoevskian element. <laughs> is that... Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. Yes, absolutely. I think it's... <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience at this point? Um, I would like to perhaps ask a question. I would have many questions, but uh, um, I was uh, thinking while well, we've been talking about the strangling as uh, strangling of cinema from the beginning and everything, and I was of course thinking about the women and which kind of women he was strangling and everything. Um, and one thing that struck me, and that's uh, why we were talking about before the, the screening about the other films that he quotes, and obviously because we have been talking and we have been seeing Elena Inés here so often in this series, when she shows up in the film, it also struck to me that she's one of she's not one of the blondes that is strangled in the film. So I was also thinking about this. Um, she's the blonde that he cannot strangle in this film or something. She's like this unreachable blonde. I was kind of thinking what role does she, because I mean, when we think about Copacabana Mon Amour that we also screen here, as she as the peroxide blonde, na ferro oxigenada, so like the fact that she's blonde in the film is also like a, a, a character, a characteristic that is important. So she's this important blonde figure of Cinema Marginal and of Bel Air and of these films and in this context. So um, I don't know if any of you had, if you had thought about anything in this direction, but as uh, the role of Elena Nays in this film is very short, but for me it's very important or very, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I saw it more as, you know, she inhabits, she is a stand-in for Brazilian cinema and this past as this kind of other space, other time, other path of cinema that's distinct from this kind of London scenario. And, you know, um, this is a gross generalization, but a blonde friend of mine said to me that blondes in Brazil get tons of attention because they're rarer. Um, so the blonde here feels very much like a European blonde. And the idea, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it seems unlikely that this baby in the beginning is really the child of the blonde, right? And so this kind of mismatch, this this problem of Brazil in relationship to Europe. Um, and the idea, on the one hand, from the earliest Cinema Novo Manifesto is that you had to embrace a poor cinema. You had to embrace the underdeveloped character of Brazil um, and the kind of exhaustion of that idea by Cinema Marginal by, by 1970 when he's making this, that she has to be killed off, you know, but she, she won't be. But somehow Elena Inés is, is, stands for something different there. She's able to kind of move out of, of the blonde as a purely allegorical device. I mean, literally, she's also the link between Cinema Novo and Cinema Marginal because she was... Uh, uh, first together with Glaube Rocha and then with Scanzella and then was part of the, the trio of Scanzella and Bressani and uh, where, she, where she 
you know, for all practical purposes, was sort of the co-author of the films uh, in in the, in Bel Air. So she's an allegory of allegorical cinema, yeah, right? <laughs> uh, if, if if you will. Here, um, I I just want to come back to something that, uh, which is sort of your main argument in your presentation, namely that um, uh, Elio Chisico's project is uh, one of cooling the cinema. Mm. Uh, in, in the transition to the Cosmo Cocas and, and uh, to the, the kind of performance that, that we just screened in, in Bresani's film. And I wondered um, where you would situate this film in this trajectory and if you could comment a little bit more on, I mean, that was basically the gist of your argument that, that Bresani uh, inspired or helped along that kind of mm. transition in, in Ojisika, but but... Could you comment a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think that the way, and again, what's so fascinating about this conversation with the Campos is that Oitizika hasn't even seen the film. So what he's taking from it is really what he can imagine of it. Um, but it's located in between. It's, it's cooled down um, enough, but it can't escape its hotness, right? I mean, maybe that's part of those kind of those long shots with a great depth of field, right? That this is something that looks like a photograph until there's action, and the rest of it continues to look like a photograph until the action arrives at the next blonde. And, you know, these are things that cinema does. Um, um, but it, it sort of can't stand doing it anymore. And so, uh, you know, all of the devices, I mean, it was so wonderful to see this in this red room because when those um, red curtains come up, we are itself, you know, we are once again in the cinema. Um, so uh, it seems that this would be this kind of moment where cinema has to acknowledge that it needs to break free of this, um, the stranglehold that all these other devices like allegory, continuity, and so on have. Um, and then, you know, in Oitisika's genealogy, at least, then Nevili Dalmeda's Mangi Bangi um, explodes it into slides, and then we get to um, the Cosmo Colcas. I mean, you know, I wouldn't necessarily put it in yeah. such a linear, or certainly not a teleological fashion. And th that's what I think is so interesting about Teo Duarte's um, research on um, La Grama Pantera, is the idea that that somehow Bressani also is learning from what Oitisika is learning from his cinema, right? And this idea that cinema might um, be this kind of catalyst, that there might be other ways of rethinking how we use cinema. Yeah, I mean, um, Mangi Bangi, since, since you brought up Mangi Bangi and the, the attempt to explode cinema, I mean, the, the, the Nevili de Almeida's uh, explicit, you know, self-declared mission was to um, show things that no one else was showing in cinema or to actually explode cinema by um, uh, uh, using up screen time for stuff like someone taking a shower for 10 minutes or so. And and there there's some similar elements in that film like the toilet scene. Yes, so, uh, although I, I see them as completely different in kind, right? Because the toilet scene is overloaded with, you know, anal retention, you know, mm. all, all of these issues. I mean, he's reading comic book, right? This is, once again, this kind of regression into this prior state. Whereas I understand Mangi Bangi, my memory, I've only seen it once, but my memory of it is it keeps the kind of, you know, it keeps that symbolic level at a minimum. There's only kind of, um, it, there is a kind of regression of the main character, but the shower, the kind of cleaning of the body, all of those things seem so quotidian. And so the length of the shot is about um, giving texture to that yes. quotidian element as opposed to forcing the point that I think this <laughs> this yeah, film does. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, I mean that that's uh, the 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 toilet scene is one that, as you said, you know, is almost overly semantic. Uh, yeah. Whereas whereas the shower scene in Mongi Bongi is, is basically it starts and then it goes on and all it says to you is there's nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but but uh, in in that sense, I mean, he written that film. Um, Memoirs of a Strangler of Brown really remains within the framework of cinema much more than mm. than Mungi Bogni does, or that the, the the clip that you just showed at the yeah. Also, I mean, the fact that it's a film of exile, I mean, I think that's also quite 
different. I mean, you know, one of the things that allegory does is allow, um, if you don't know too much about things, you can quite easily like slot them in, you know. And so the project of what Navili doing and sort of documenting a certain moment that would not otherwise appear within Brazil, I think is the um, imperative is different. Um, anybody else have a question? Or may I? Or yes. Right here. Could you please um, refer once again to your conceptualization of an alphabetic cinema um, as opposed to Freire's concept of um, literacy and developing literacy? You said there's a transversal moment in your concept. Yeah, well, so, um, okay, so first the idea that film is, as McLuhan, McLuhan argues that film is a literate art. So to make um, film analphabetic is to make it sort of deliterate or to regress again um, or to inhabit a place before cinema has become literate. Um, and again, he, McLuhan thinks it's literate because of the temporal sequencing, right, that we are sort of forced to follow one thing after another. Um, Paulo Freire, his process of alphabetization, of becoming literate, is that you break down the language, then the participant is able to mobilize the different units to combine them. Once they understand that principle of combination, they can start to manipulate and form language. So his goal is to become literate, of course. Um, but Literacy only works if words retain their conventions, right? If we use them the way we understand them, if they're spelled properly, so on and so forth. So you need convention um, in order for literacy to occur. And I think the projects of people like Oitisika and Dalmeida and Bressani was to reimagine language. They don't want you to just integrate the participant into the dominant order of language or ideology or what have you. They want to reimagine what that language is. And so that's what I meant by analphabetic, um, was something that is n neither literate nor illiterate, but something that imagines a way towards a new language, but from the building blocks of what was there before. Does that help? Anybody else have a comment, a question? Um, perhaps I would like to know what you guys thought about the last uh, sentence that then we have very few texts in this film, as we saw it, very, very little verbal. And this whole, I mean, I don't the whole literacy thing is about the language of cinema in general, but this last phrase that he writes, I thought it was very uh, interesting. The, what the expert is tired of today, the public will be tired of tomorrow. Um, oh, I had the chance to see the film before, so I had the chance to stop. and Because <laughs> I don't know if that was very readable, but that's what he writes in the end on his piece of paper. Um, um, I don't know if you guys... Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah. this is a little bit of a riddle to me because <clears throat> one would think to say, oh, this, you know, this is about audience, the idea that, you know, what's, what has a shock value of, you know, will no longer very soon. But I'm not sure that that really lines up with how cinema marginal was being received. I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it never went mainstream per se, although, I mean, although there were films um, that did have some commercial success, I, I, I wasn't sure what to make of that either because it, that was the way that I initially would have um, interpreted it, but it didn't quite line up with what I know about reception history, but maybe you have other thoughts. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's pretty hard to crack open. Um, I mean, b b what's interesting about Cinema Marginal is that there's a range of films from like something like uh, O Bandido da Luz Vermelha, which was sort of a hit, uh, to uh, some of the Bel Air films, which were barely screened anywhere, or this film was, you know, um, uh, wasn't wasn't much in circulation, or Monkey Bungie, which. Uh, is almost a, a, a never-seen film or an invisible film. 
Uh, so there's there's that whole range of, of works that are really truly marginal in the sense that they never got an audience. And at the same time, this film too works with the kind of character and 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 topics that you would find in commercial exploitation films. Um, uh, so I, I was also asking myself how, how you spoke about this. You, you said there's a fantasy of a public, or at least a dream of reaching a public. You know, this is not a, a part of the reason why uh, Oichisiko, uh reacted so adversely to the um, anthology screening device or, or dispositive was that it was so. Uh, you know, individualistic and elitist, and 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 uh, sort of, sort of broke down the collective cinema experience into atomized intellectual units, which was clearly not what Oichisika was interested in. Um, but but what's interesting about that last line is is you know the the easy way to phrase it would have been what the expert likes today is what uh, what the public likes tomorrow but it's uh, but what what he really writes is what the expert is tired of today is what the public will be tired of tomorrow um so there's an ennui uh element to it i was kind of thinking whether that's also a kind of um sign that one i mean what they're trying to do something different or something new because perhaps you know to, to bring something new so that to, um once you're tired of something, then to just reinvent this this language of cinema or this way of making cinema, but uh, it also, in a way, implicates that you need to constantly be reinventing yourself because at some point you're going to be tired of something that you need to always be reinventing. And um, I was just making the connection now. What you showed the, this clip from um, um, Pantera. Lagrima Pantera, thank you. I didn't know that and I, I thought it was fascinating because I was always thinking, well, they are doing so many new things in the level of a language in this cinema marginal and everything in cinema, but they are mostly still stuck to the cinema room, to the production, single channel projection in the cinema room with a certain length, etc. So, um, other than the Cosmococcus and the things that Neville Almeida did with Doite Sica, I didn't know much of other um, filmmakers from this period that had done um, different kind of projects in different spaces, thinking of cinema in different spaces. So, I thought that's very fascinating. It, I think it really opens up a nice um, way of thinking of, of Bressani or of what Cinema Marginal uh, could mean in, dif in an even new way of thinking about the moving image in general, in not in just in the classic cinema concept, or yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think you know, obviously, I I agree. <laughs> I guess you know because I um, so I only have watched this twice. Today is the second time, and the first time I also didn't know what to make of that um, phrase. I guess the other thing that I think we should put on the table, if we want to, you know, just discuss it further or not, but is our tiredness at seeing them strangled, like we're sort of bored. But I actually found this more interesting the second time, even though I knew it was going to take a long time to get through <laughs> all of them, because although it's a repetition um, that he can't escape, the moments of difference become all the more, you know, beautiful um, and specific and singular. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if that also plays into what's exhausting or... Be I have another reading before we listen to yours. Uh, no, it's, it, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on, on something that you mentioned, Mayakovsky. Uh, uh, there can't be a revolution without a revolution of form. There's no revolutionary art without revolutionary art. Or there's no revolutionary yeah. art without a revolutionary form, which are, sort of preempts um, uh, socialist realism. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but which, if a Brazilian in in the um, uh, late 60s and early 70s, uh, if, 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 if somebody in that context quotes it, of course, refers to, you know, precisely the kind of left-wing critique of Tropicalia that was brought forward by certain more conservative uh, uh, aesthetically more conservative um, uh, elements of, of, of the left wing movement where they said you know we can't we, we need to be more conventional to reach the people and we can't do all these fancy experiments and you're being irresponsible um, um, so uh, what what 
that last sentence probably also refers to is is the need to deconstruct to strangle the the non-revolutionary forms and and so the aesthetic revolution comes from uh, popularizing the strangling of conventional forms uh, it's sort of a you know that the pro whole project of this film is to to deconstruct a certain type of of genre logic um, and 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 uh, to 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 get a different kind of beauty out of that sense of repetition, um, but ultimately the project is to destroy uh, genre cinema by doing so. Yeah, um, the critique of Chapakalia is interesting because. Um Chapakalia was something that did become popularized. Yeah. So, and Oitisika, um was furious about this. Um, and he really holds on to um, some notion that um, there is something, not purity, because he already says purity is a myth, but that there is um, a kind of critical power of Chapakalia that is dissolved in its popularization. Um, and his kind of antidote to that is to kind of move even further into abstraction away from iconography. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's interesting. You know, I, I'm an art historian, and I um, my sort of my love is abstraction. And so it's interesting thinking also about film because film is hardly ever abstract, except for these you know Eisenstein films that were never made of. Das Kapital, right? <laughs> Which we can just imagine in our heads, you know, black leader and so on and so forth. But what does it mean to, it, it, what, at what levels can abstraction occur in something like cinema? And how do you deal, if you're a filmmaker, with the kinds of um, conundrums that someone like Oitisika faced when dealing with uh, a kind of critical impulse that is then appropriated? 1970, Oitisika wrote, you know, um, Brazil diarrhea, you know, this, this you know, so-called anthropophagic um, impulse of Brazil also has its counterpoint. If you're eating so much, it's coming out the other way, which is another yeah. reason the bathroom scene is so important, right? So diarrhea, you know, anthropophagy is not always, um, it, it can't always be, it's not the solution to everything. And yeah. the diarrhea is the, the shit of um, appropriation, the shit of the military government, all that mixed together. That wasn't really an answer to anything, but just continuing the conversation. <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience. Um, yeah, I was I was just wondering um, how we could read the fact that um, all this killing is going on while it's day, so poor daylight, which I was I found it interesting. Also, along with the repetition, um, that it becomes so quite normal. And um, it reminds me of the uh, Nosferatu film we, we saw, which is also kind of, he was killing and nobody was um, wondering or noticing or, um, and it was like going on and on. So That's Nosferatu do Brasil, yeah. do Brasil by Cardoso. Um, yeah, and I was just wondering how we could um, read this also like in the confrontation with um, this everyday routines that are putting putting in um, in between so yeah I mean, I'm not sure I have um where I guess I'll just say my sort of the moment that comes to mind in order to sort of think with you about this um, is the moment where he invites the two girls into a dark room. And this is a really interesting moment because it cites a kind of a scene in um, Matoa Familia e Foi o Cinema, where the two girls are in the bedroom kind of making out. But also, it anticipates the scene in Lagrima Pantera, um, several scenes. Um, but it's a s highly cinematic scene, right? There's the swinging light, which feels like a projection. He's in the dark, you know, so it's both a primal scene enacted, like peeking through the bedroom, but also the scene of cinema. But that's the time that he's able to escape this compulsion. So cinema is one outlet for fantasy that 
gets us out of this kind of problem, cinema, the dark cinema. And, you know, I'm not sure actually what else to do with that, but I think that that's, um, it lines up with killed the family and went to the cinema in some ways, that cinema is a kind of answer to the kind of suffocation that occurs in the light of day in the bourgeois family. Um, I don't know if you have other thoughts. I was going to try and make the case that this is a highly abstract film. Um, and I wonder what you thought of that. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of a, a, the Kiriko type of quality to, to these outdoor scenes where, you know, you would expect somebody to intervene or maybe the police to show up, but that just never, never uh, uh, plays any role, you know, that the, they're just these statuesque blondes and they're being assassinated and that's it. And then he twirls his moustache and walks away. Um, and there's no other element. So it, it's a bit like the metaphysical cityscapes. Of or Alain René, I think. Or René, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong René element to it. And um, I would say the color scheme is highly abstract. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. basically white, green, black, and red. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, the, the, the yeah, the, the scarf, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the colored scarf. But apart from that, it's 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 really reduced. So it's it's uh, and and he always has these locations where he can control color. Um, so it's an Arnheiminian film in the sense that it highlights the artificiality of the film medium. And mm -hmm. that sense, I would say it's pretty. It's quite abstract, actually, and and yeah, certainly not, more not, not than his previous from, films. Sorry? Certainly more than his previous. Well, it was films. Certainly more than the previous yeah. films, yeah, and and in a way closer to what Ojisika was doing prior to '68. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just. Yeah. No. I. I mean. I'm, I mean. I'm, I agree. In, in terms of like here. degrees of abstraction, um, certainly both in terms of a kind of what you see, but then also the structure that you have a kind of setup that, that you repeat with this variation. You know, I mean, that's a kind of classic thing to do in abstraction as a kind of composition, a composition with variations. Um. Yeah. Thank you for indulging me on this film. I well, th thanks for bringing the, the film to us <laughs> and for, for presenting it so brilliantly. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Um, this is the second to last event uh, here in this room. Uh, again, tomorrow night we'll screen uh, uh, Ochisiko Super 8 films, and they will be presented and introduced by Irene and uh, Cesar Ochisika. Um This is a, 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 another free event, as you already mentioned. It takes place at Sosfi Art Pavilion, which is behind the Fleming Hotel on Escherzheimer Tour. Um, also, there's a bar. Uh, so you're all welcome to join us there tomorrow. And the last event in the series will be Juan Suarez on July 5th on uh, Andrea Tonacci. Thanks again for coming, Irene. And thanks again for a, a brilliant talk and a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for staying. <laughs>